and a Baptist preacher and a Muslim mullah sitting together in a bar. And the mullah <clears throat> turned to the rabbi and said, now if you're expecting a joke, you're a typical American. If you're expecting a joke, if you recognize that formula for a joke, that is evidence that you have a mindset framed by a particular worldview. That that is, in fact, even a possible scenario in your mind. That a mullah, a priest, a rabbi, and a Baptist preacher are sitting together in a bar is evidence that your mind is framed by a particular worldview. And it's a particular worldview that most Muslims in the Middle East cannot even begin to fathom and look upon with the greatest antipathy. The, the reality is, is that it's difficult for us to even begin to understand the deep-seated cultural mistrust, hatred, even loathing that exists at a very visceral level as well as a deeply internal epistemological level in the Middle East because our worldview excludes those notions. So the first thing that I want to tell you this morning is, is that even after we go through all the reasons, even after we detail everything in uh, our carefully constructed outline, <laughs> you're still not going to completely understand. Because you have certain presuppositions. Y you're going to want to reason away their reasons. You have an Enlightenment, Western, pluralistic, liberal background that is your basic operating system. And no matter what software we load into that system, you're going to always default to a particular way of thinking that will always bring you back to that joke. So, right up front, let me say, all of our labored efforts to understand the Muslim world, all of our efforts to to try and find a bridge of reconciliation, to, to develop ways to enter into dialogue, to enter into detente, to initiate negotiations, will ultimately come up against a kind of fierce consistency in the Muslim world because they actually have a sense of what they believe. And it's a sense that is a whole lot more clear than in our muddied, enlightenment, modernist, Western world. That's the first thing that we need to understand. Even the most ignorant, the most uneducated, the most impoverished Muslim has as a part of their world view an antipathy to almost everything that the West stands for. And when there are opportunities to initiate dialogue and to have uh, rapport, it is only because those particular Muslims have begun to have inconsistencies, what we might call glorious inconsistencies in their worldview. Now, with that as a kind of presupposition, let's back up a couple of thousand years. I want to take you to the time of Jeremiah the prophet. It's the, uh, the end of the 7th, the beginning of the 6th century B.C. And Jeremiah is a very young man, the, um, the senior prophet in Israel at the time was a fellow by the name of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a frustrated prophet in the same way that Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. If you know anything at all about Habakkuk's prophecy, 
it begins with a series of questions. The first question is, Lord, why are you tolerating your covenant people so long without judgment? He begins to detail in chapter 1, beginning with uh, verses 2 and 3 of his prophecy, he begins to detail the wickedness, the greed, the madness that has swept across the covenant people of God. They've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, and they don't seem to see it. They, in fact, have, um, have assumed an intellectual posture that puts them on a par with everyone else in the world. As a result, Habakkuk essentially says, my people have Babylonian hearts. They're just like the Babylonians. In fact, they are filled up with, and he uses a peculiar Hebrew word here, it's the word Hamas. They are filled with Hamas. It's a Hebrew word that literally means mad, senseless, brutal violence. They're filled with Hamas. And so Habakkuk says, Lord, why don't you come and judge this people? Habakkuk accuses God of underreacting. So then, beginning in verse 4, God begins to respond to Habakkuk and says to Habakkuk, you don't know everything that's going on. Behind the scenes, I'm l preparing for a time when, in fact, the Babylonian horde, with their weapons of mass destruction, with their shock and awe methods, and he actually details in some uh, gory detail what that would entail, when the Babylonians will come and sweep across the land and judge this unfaithful, Hamas-filled people. At that point, Habakkuk starts backpedaling. He says, no, 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 you don't understand, God. I want you to judge this people, but I don't want you to judge this people like that. That's a little too much. Now, God, you're overreacting. It's what I call the Goldilocks syndrome. For Habakkuk, it's always too hard or too soft, too hot, too cold. It's never just right. He figures he's got God entirely figured out and in a box. Well, in chapter 2 of Habakkuk's prophecy, God begins to unfold his purposes to the prophet. He lists a series of five great woes that he will visit on the people. And the woes are all related to the pride of the people of Israel, the covenant people. They have, they have pride that is all-consuming because they trust in their own flesh, the right arm of their own strength. They will be consumed because their pride has... Um, has led them to strategic planning initiatives to secure them against all threats. God will bring woes against them, he says, because they have trusted in their own wealth and ingenuity. He'll bring woes against them, he says, because my covenant people have, have actually begun to believe that they can outwit the fallenness of this world. And finally, because the covenant people simply cannot discern the differences in a world marked by antithesis, they will be confronted. Bottom line, if my people are going to act like Babylonians, if they're going to think like Babylonians, if they're going to have Babylonian hearts, I will give them Babylonians in spades. Chapter 3 of Habakkuk, final section, is a hymn of praise. Habakkuk has been thoroughly rebuked. He begins to realize that his problem all along was not that his people were filled with Hamas and the Babylonians were, in fact, defined by Hamas, and that, uh, th th that God was in a box. His problem was that he simply did not have a clear 
an understandable worldview that matched the way the world actually was. As a result, he was purblind. So Habakkuk says, Lord, in light of all of that, renew in the years what you have always done. Unveil it so that we can see it. Now, now, I, I run you through that quick survey of Habakkuk because I see in Habakkuk extraordinary parallels to our own situation and our own circumstances, particularly as we deal with conflict of the modern-day Babylonians, of the modern-day Hamas. Part of the reason why the conflict is as acute and as confusing as it is for us is that we have Habakkuk's Goldilocks syndrome. We have, in fact, the worldview confusion that created frustration in Habakkuk. Bottom line, the reason we can't understand the Babylonians of our day is that we have Babylonian hearts ourselves and have failed to recognize it. The Hamas that we so despise in them is actually a characteristic of us. Now, Habakkuk tries a little scheme. Once he begins to get the drift of God, in the middle of chapter 2, he wants to have a scale of righteousness. Where he says, well, yeah, okay, we're, we're filled up with Hamas, but their Hamas is so much worse. Their mad, senseless, greedy violence is so much worse than our mad, senseless, greedy violence. And so surely, God, you're going ju to judge their mad, senseless, greedy violence first. But God quickly informs Habakkuk that there isn't a scale like that that he operates on. There is, in fact, in the world, a great antithesis, a dividing line, and only one dividing line. It is the dividing line between the city of God and the city of man. It is the dividing line between those who adhere to the righteousness of the sovereign and living God by grace, through faith, this not of themselves, for it is a gift of God bestowed by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ or not. That's it. Only two choices. Now, when we come to the Muslim world, we have to say that, as, as Habakkuk would define them, the Babylonians of our time actually understand some of this more clearly than we do. That's why you would never hear in Baghdad a joke that begins, there was a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi and a Muslim mullah and a Baptist preacher sitting in a bar. And the mullah turned to the rabbi and said, you're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear that because there is a kind of clarity to the understanding that there is a great divide in culture. The first thing that we need to do, I believe, in coming to understand the Muslim world is to overcome our own Habakkuk syndrome, our own Goldilocks syndrome. Part of the problem that comes when we try and wrestle with why is it that so many in the Muslim world hate us Part of the problem there is not their hatred. It is our lack of comprehension of the divide that ultimately separates us, which in turn only breeds more hatred. We need to have the same kind of self-conscious worldview that they at least have an inkling of. And we need to realize that we have different world views, and that ultimately defines everything.
Now, uh, let's talk about some of the details of the differences between worldview, between East and West a little bit, because, because this, uh, this will uh, provide for us some sense of why it is, at least, that it is America, the United States of America, modern America, that uh, in the Muslim world there is the greatest antipathy for. First of all, we need to understand that the trajectory of history has brought us to a place that, uh, that indeed, what time founder uh, Henry Booth uh, Luce once said is absolutely true. We are living in the American century. We're living in the American century, therefore, antipathy for the West quickly, naturally, easily translates, particularly for those who don't have all of the facts, who are doing a cursory reading of world events, uh, antipathy naturally focuses on us because we are at the apex of the trajectory of Western history. We have the greatest wealth. We have the greatest power. We are the sole remaining superpower. There aren't alternative enemies out there. We talked about this before when we talked about revolutionary Islam a couple of months ago. The fact is, is that, there, that there are no alternative enemies for Islam to look to. There aren't crusaders out there. Uh, the French are not a threat. We're it. We're the only enemy. And so part of the reason that there is such directed antipathy towards the United States is that, that we are, in fact, it. But, but also the trajectory of history has meant that if there was to be any good to come out of the extraordinary wealth of the West, if there was to be any redemption for the poor, the despised, the rejected, the oppressed, the tyrannized, then it surely would have to come from the hand of the West. And if America is not there to save the widows and the orphans in their distress, then surely those vast treasure houses of wealth must be stored up for wickedness only. Because those vast storehouses of wealth surely are not being expended to help us. So the only alternative in a, in a world that is clearly black and white is that if, if the trajectory of history has brought America to the pinnacle, they're, they're the obvious target, the obvious enemy, and their vast treasuries of wealth are not being expended for good, but rather to provide bootleg copies of Madonna videos in the market square. If that's, if that's the fruit of this, bad Nike t-shirts, Tommy Hilfiger knockoffs, if this is what we get from America, then surely this is the great Satan. And that's the only possibility in their minds. Now, let me define a term real quick. In the Muslim world, there are many devils, many demons. In fact, if you, um, if you recall from any of your reading or from an earlier lecture, one of the things about uh, Islam is that it is very spiritual and there are uh, parallel spiritual realms, lots of devils, lots of jinn, as they call them, um, in the world. In fact, in the early days, it was a part of Muhammad's task to sort out in a very polytheistic society w which of these jinn were good jinn and which of them were bad jinn. And so when, when we talk about the great Satan, it's put into the context of a world filled with devils. But there are chief devils, chief conspirators in the spirit realm. And each of those devils has regions of dominion or authority. It's the same sort of perspective that we, that we see when we read, for instance, in, um, in the book of Daniel. And we see that there are spirit princes who have dominion over certain realms. 
Uh, that's the perspective. So when, when a Muslim says this vast storehouse of wealth, that the trajectory of history has brought to America is under the dominion of a great Satan, their assertion is that in the spirit realm, the dominating influence of America must be demonic because the fruit of this culture is not justice, but some sort of dim-witted Hamas. A Hamas that comes to us in Michael Jackson videos. A Hamas that comes to us in Britney Spears' belly button ring. A Hamas that comes to us in terms of bad hamburgers. That being sort of the, the drawing point, the dividing point for, for the average Muslim, you add insult to injury with the fact that since 1917, Britain and the United States have been the chief sponsors of Israel in the world. This is the ultimate affront. Now, historically, this has not always been the case, that, uh, that, that to uh, support or to sponsor Jews is, uh, is anathema. In fact, if you know anything about Islamic history, you know that for many, many years, the Jewish people and the Jewish culture were best protected in Islamic uh, uh, sultanates as opposed to uh, the West. At a time in the Middle Ages when pogroms uh, were unleashed against the Jews in anti-Semitic purges all across the Western world, there were places in the Muslim world where Jews could find safe harbor. But the Jews were always kept on a leash. They were always confined to uh, Islamically defined parameters. And what the United States and Britain did was they, they destroyed that system of dehima, that, that system of control. And as a result, they have unleashed this other alternative threat to Islamic dominance of the world, the Jews. And it is simply an affront. The, the fact that in American foreign policy, we think that we can somehow broker a deal between the Jewish and the Muslim world is like us telling a joke. There was a rabbi, there was a priest, there was a mullah, and there was a preacher in a bar. It's as alien to their worldview. Part of the reason that, uh, that Muslims will enter into negotiations, detente, dialogue, Oslo Accords, and so forth, is simply that they see it as a tactic to buy time. A tactic to buy time for when they will ultimately rid the world of the blight of an independent Jewry. And so, when we sponsor Israel, when we support Israel, when we stand by Israel, that is further evidence, like our great treasury house of wealth, hoarded for our own good, our own Hamas, this is evidence that we are controlled by some satanic influence. In addition to the trajectory of history and the sponsorship of Israel, there is considerable resentment in the Muslim world that the coin of the realm of the empire of globalism is the American dollar. In the Islamic worldview, Islam must ultimately dominate. Dominate the whole world. Culturally, politically, spiritually, it is the destiny of the world to become a part of Dar al-Islam, to become a part of the world of Islam. 
In fact, converts to Islam are not called converts. They're called reverts. Because in an Islamic worldview, the normal and natural state of affairs is, uh, is to be in Dar al-Islam. Therefore, everyone is lapsed, lapsed from their anthropological memory, lapsed from uh, their spiritual memory. Therefore, anything that shows dominance over Islam is, is ultimately a slap against their worldview. So when we talk about the petrodollars of Saudi Arabia, that is like sounding off with blasphemy against Muhammad. Because they have a unified worldview. Where there is no separation of church and state. There is no separation of, of army and religion. Uh, there is no uh, separation of economy and religion. It is all one unified, seamless worldview, at least in its most consistent form. The, the fact is, is that to talk about petrodollars coming from Saudi Arabia is to define the world in a way, both economically and linguistically, that is an affront to them. I mean, this, this goes to every layer. Everything we think about the Middle East ultimately becomes an affront to them. This is one of the reasons why the Americans are often taken aback by how testy a Muslim will be in a conversation. It's like they're ready to pick a fight right from the beginning. We're sitting there going, I just said hello. Well, even the way we say hello oftentimes is an affront to their culture, to their cultural norms, to their worldview. The fact that the United States dominates the global economy even when our stock market is doing poorly, even when oil prices decline, even when uh, the NASDAQ is, uh, is in trouble, the fact that those factors determine the health of the global economy is an affront to them. We're like the wicked Roman emperors who have swept in and imposed our corrupt morally decrepit system over the structure of the whole world. And the, the, the mindset is, is that because it has no moral moorings, it only takes a few good pops for the whole thing to collapse. On top of all of this, the language of God for the Muslim, the language of revelation, the purest language is of course Arabic. The fact that most Muslims cannot read classical Arabic, the fact that, that most of the world has as its second language, if not its first language, the lingua franca of this new global empire is English, and American English at that is yet another affront. It is as if we have imposed on the world this sort of artificial layer of Hamas. And they rankle at it. Now, you'll notice a couple of things from my, from my outline here. I, I, I hope you notice immediately. I have not talked about doctrine. Islam is supremely non-doctrinal. It is a religion of action. It is a, a religion of discipline. It is a religion that operates out of a very clear, very articulated worldview, but, uh, but, but it is not a matter of quibbling over doctrines. This is one of the reasons why oftentimes debates uh, between Muslim clerics and, uh, and, and, and Christian clerics tends to confuse more than help. Second thing you may notice is that um, I, have, I have not defined the breach in terms of the Christian world versus the Muslim world. Part of the reason for that is that um, the, the Christian world is so inconsistent 
in its articulation of and belief in and submission to the tenets of biblical Christianity that, that it's not really even an issue. The Western world really is more Babylonian than the Babylonian world is, as defined in Habakkuk's sort of analysis. As a result, the, the great conflict is not between Islam and Christianity. The great conflict, as defined in their worldview, is Islam against everything else. It is Islam against everything that is not Islamic. And the fact that Christianity has become so impotent in its articulation and because the Enlightenment West, the rationalistic West, is so clueless in dealing with, with presuppositions and principles that are unshakable, bottom line, we are lost in the fog. The result is that over the last 20 years or so, the antipathy, the hatred of the Muslim world toward the West has resolved itself into a kind of universal contempt. It's not so much that they hate Americans. In fact, in many cases, they love Americans. But there is contempt for the culture a culture that destroys itself. They see that clearly. Your laws redefine the family, so now you don't even know what a family is. You have taken that which is wrong and made it right, and that which is right and made it wrong. And yet, you still have this treasure house of wealth and this, this mighty power. Surely, this house of cards is about to collapse. There is a sense of contempt when they regard the Western world. That's part of the reason why they are so quickly dismissive of any attempts at real reconciliation or a real dialogue, because it is madness to speak to a fool. And the West is so filled up with Hamas that we are but fools oftentimes in their eyes. Now, because we have wealth, because we have power, we may be fools that, that have to be dealt with from time to time. But it's just a matter of time. Now, very quickly, before we get to some solutions, what do we do about all of this? Let, let me say that any time we talk about things in these broad generalities, we're not talking about every single Muslim in the world. Uh, th th there are more and less consistent Muslims, just like there are more and less consistent Christians. There are more and less consistent Muslim countries in the same way that there are more or less consistent Christian countries. Well, if there are any Christian countries. And on top of all of that, there are places in the Muslim world where confidence in the Muslim worldview has been shaken. That's one of the reasons why I believe there's such a strategic opportunity in the work among the Kurdish people. Because while the, 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 the Islamic worldview has not been displaced, it has been shaken. It has been shaken because of the injustice heaped up on the Kurdish people through all these years. And so there is a strategic opportunity there. But, but it, it does mean that that Islamic worldview, which still is the basic operating system, is in place. It's just shaken. It's just unstable. It's Windows 3.5 instead of XP. So, given all of this, what do we do? What are our options? How, how do we respond to this, this kind of loggerheads in global affairs. I'd like to suggest a couple of important steps for us. 
First of all, Habakkuk, in recovering his own biblical worldview, does something very unusual. Chapter 3 of the book of Habakkuk is a psalm of praise, as I already told you. It's, uh, it's musical. Now, if the, uh, the irony of that hasn't hit you yet, uh, let me explain. Habakkuk has just gone through this long philosophical, cultural argument with God. You would expect that once he comes to his resolution, that he would be able to uh, sit down and create a bullet listing of strategic lessons learned. Or, or perhaps write a manifesto of what a biblical worldview actually is, or a, or a mission statement. That's what we would do. We'd probably hold a conference, uh, work out certain propositions, then gather at the end of the conference and we'd all sign it. Very propositional. We, we create, in a sense, this series of arguments based upon the lessons that we have learned. That's not what Habakkuk does. Habakkuk sings. It's a poem. It's a complex poem with incredibly rich literary structure. There are three stanzas. Each of the stanzas has three different parts. Each one of the parts focuses uh, not only on a different emotion or sense, but, but also on a different historical epic. Bottom line is, is that we can't approach the problem of worldview dissonance merely rationalistically. We have to approach it biblically. And when we approach this worldview dissonance biblically, the first thing that happens is that we are drawn into worship, and worship is always a history lesson in the Scriptures. Worship that does not take us through redemptive history is missing its backbone. It's one of the reasons why the American church is lost in the world today because we have not remembered. Over and over and over again, the, the, the scriptures teach us that those who do not remember will ultimately stumble and fall. Jesus tells us that there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who are doers of the word and those who are forgetful hearers. Worship is necessarily a history lesson. So Habakkuk reviews redemptive history. He says, okay, God, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And you've done this. Renew in the midst of the years all of these things, Lord. He's reminding himself of a biblical worldview. It begins by heeding history. We need to look at the history of, of Western relations with the Muslim world and not assume that it is long ago and far away. Go to certain places in Turkey and they're still talking about the Crusades and they're still mad about it. And we can hardly figure out what century to put Richard the Lionheart in or who Salah ad is or who Suleiman the Magnificent might have been. And they're, they're talking about it as if it's Uncle Louie. Second thing that Habakkuk does in the third chapter of, of Habakkuk is that um, he begins to realize uh, that his approach to the world has to be framed principially and not emotionally. Habakkuk naturally wants to respond in the flesh in certain ways. One of the most difficult things that the Bush administration is facing right now is that the Bush administration clearly articulated prior to the Iraq war a set of principles and then attempted to garner support for the war on a series of expectations separate from the principles. 
the Bush Doctrine was terrorists and all those who truck with terrorists will meet with the hand of justice. That's the Bush Doctrine. Terrorists and those who truck with terrorists will meet with the hand of justice. Very clear, articulated principle. But that principle was argued in terms of a series of expectations that have proven to be either unfulfillable expectations or perhaps even false expectations. Weapons of mass destruction tyranny imposed by Saddam and his regime, Ba'athist ideology, and so forth. You see the conflict there? The conflict is, is that now what we want is we want to find evidence of weapons of mass destruction. We're no longer talking about the Bush doctrine anymore. We've, we've abandoned the principles to talk about the peripherals. And, and, and the administration has actually been drawn into the trap of focusing on and attempting to defend the peripherals when it was the principle of the thing that drove the engine in the first place. We do the same thing. We do the same thing when we approach the Muslim world. We, we abandon principle and we start talking about all the peripherals. We attempt to make cultural arguments. We attempt to make rationalistic Western pluralistic arguments. Why can't we all just get along kinds of arguments? And that simply does not wash in a world like the Muslim world where principle often comes long before any rationalistic discussion. We've got to learn the lesson of the Bush Doctrine. And that is simply this, when you abandon your principle and focus on the peripherals, you lose every time because you've abandoned your strength. What that means ultimately is that the bridge of reconciliation to the Muslim world is ultimately one thing and one thing only. It is not economic development. It is not democracy. It is, it is not establishing stable management of the oil fields. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. The Great Commission is the means by which we can reconcile East and West. It is, it is fulfilling our principal command in the midst of the world. Go ye therefore into all the world. Teaching, baptizing, and discipling. Because we have, we have assumed a thousand other priorities, pursued a thousand other agendas, the antipathy between East and West has only grown. This is why what Servant Group is doing is of such vital importance. What happens with Servant Group in Northern Iraq is of more strategic importance than anything that Tommy Franks can ever bring to pass. We need to be clear about that. What, what, what our missionaries are doing day by day with little boys and little girls, with moms and dads in northern Iraq is of more and greater significance to global history than anything that all of the warriors and the, uh, the planners, uh, the, the, all that the CIA and the Pentagon have ever wrought. We need to be clear about that. And we need to recognize that because we still tolerate Hamas in our midst, that it is difficult for us to actually see that. We, like Habakkuk, have been stricken with a Goldilocks syndrome. And that's why it's difficult for us to understand why they hate us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you for your truth.
principles that undergird all of history, which we run up against oftentimes in our madness, but which never ultimately change. Gird us, guard us from the Goldilocks syndrome, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Great question. In fact, that was one of Habakkuk's questions. One of Habakkuk's questions in chapter 1 of Habakkuk is, Lord, why do you allow the Babylonians to even exist with their shock and awe tactics, with their weapons of mass destruction? Why are they here and why do they plague us? God doesn't directly answer Habakkuk by saying, um, well, here, he is. here are the tactical reasons why I've allowed the Babylonian horde to exist. Instead, he kind of turns it. And he says to Habakkuk, in a sense, um, why is it that my own people have Babylonian hearts that ultimately belie more of my goodness than the Babylonian hearts in the Babylonians themselves? In other words, Habakkuk uh, has the tables turned on him. And, uh, and the question is reposed. And that is, why is it that those who have been given so much, who have received the grace and the mercy of God, uh, where the gospel has run freely in a culture, why is it that those people are just like the Babylonians? So I, I think part of the, the, the question um, uh, reveals the answer. And that is, God is not going to bring a hand of judgment against the Muslim world as long as in our hearts we continue in the same sort of unbelief that they do. In other words, the Babylonians become the prod of God for the church to be the church. Other questions? Yes. How do we combat the, the fact that in public discourse, everybody focuses on the peripherals rather than the principles? Now, I think that the answer is that we keep hammering on the principles. We, we keep going back to these basic principles. Um, and, and we ourselves become the, the beacon lights and the salt to, to constantly call this up short. This is a, a strategy that, uh, th that has, ha has always been a kind of thorn in the side to the media elite. And it drives them crazy, but it's the only thing that ultimately drives the debate forward. Um, if, you, if You may have seen this a time or two, perhaps on Larry King Live, where Larry King Live... Uh, where Larry King asks a question and he gets a principled answer back and he's shocked. <laughs> well, what do you mean? So he, he asks the question in a different way, hoping to get the right answer again, and he's, he's shocked again. And it's, it's almost like, whoa, whoa, roll the cameras. Something is actually happening for a change here. You know, one, one of the things that David Wells says in his remarkable a series of, of books about the collapse of the evangelical principled culture. He says that in our world today, truth, even the smallest truth, resounds like a thunderclap because we are so unused to hearing that. We, we've got to acclimate our culture to hearing it. See, that that's, was the role of the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, they, they, they rankled n normalcy by simply saying the truth. That's our calling. We are ambassadors of Christ. We have the prophetic mantle in the world. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. And it will rankle our world. The fact that we're not doing it, the fact that we're playing for, for airtime, we're, we're looking for book sales. We're, we're you know, uh, attempting to make our way in the truck of commerce rather than merely speaking the truth is 
evidence of why it is that our culture simply doesn't hear the truth. We're intent on being evangelically correct, which is far worse than being politically correct. It is, because it's so much more schlocky. 